Hi, welcome to lesson 3.2. These are the objectives that we are going to cover. So first of all, atomic radii. What we mentioned in lesson one was the shells here, but you can also use the word principal energy level. So we're gonna use those two interchangeably. Now, what's really important about this unit is we've finished stoichiometry, perhaps if that's what the order you did it in, and that's the math. We're really moving into the English side and explaining things now. So it's really important that you use Pay attention to the key words and how they're used to explain these things. If you look across these things here, what you're gonna see generally is a general trend is they get smaller as they go across. Now the reason they get smaller is because it's all the same principal energy level, it's all the same shell. The only thing that's changing is it's getting more and more positive. So the nucleus is getting more and more positive so that is called the nuclear charge. And what's happening is the electrons, the valence shell electrons, valence cell electrons, are getting more and more attracted to the positive protons in the nucleus. And so they're able to pull them closer to the them, to them, to center. And so they're getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Now the size of the nucleus itself is kind of irrelevant because if you remember from topic two, it's really tiny. If the whole atom was the size of a football field, the nucleus is only the size of a tennis ball. And so there's a lot of charge, but the size of it is, is really minor. But the size of the shells is massive, and so that what that's what takes up most of the space of the atom. So you can see with all of these here, it's getting more and more positive, the nucleus. So it's the, all the electrons are in the same shell, and so they're getting pulled closer and closer to the positive nucleus because the number of protons are increasing. So the shell is slowly decreasing in size. Now as you go down, the atomic radius is increasing because even though there is an increase in protons as you go down and there's quite a jump, it's, it's going to a completely new shell, which is much, much larger. Now ionic radar is a good way to trick you because it's you'll think you may not realize that there's a change in the electrons. So what the fluorines or the chlorines or the non-metals have done is they've gained electrons to get a full shell. So what they've effectively done is is get a full extra shell. And so they're always much bigger. And what the non-metals have done is they've lost electrons and they've completely given away one of their shells to get a full lower shell. And so they always have a much smaller radii. Now the first ionized energy we've covered in topic two. So this is hopefully review. It's the gaseous states. You must always say one mole of electrons uh, from atoms or ions in the gaseous phase. This is so important it's often underlined and it's a complete mole. So that equation represents one mole of this, giving one mole of this, losing just one electron in, in the gaseous state. And so go back to topic two if you're a bit unclear about why there are these jumps here. Uh, the main reasons are it's because we've gone to a full shell uh, and so as you go you make these big jumps here there this becomes a whole lot easier because you're just pulling away one but this one here is a full shell it's a noble gas so they don't like getting their electrons pulled away and as you go further and further away from being a full shell these ones become easier because they want to become plus anyway uh, and these ones want to become minus and gain one and these this here is a S shell, and so it's fine to pull one away from a P, but it's not so fine to pull one when it's got a nice complete sub-level. This here is mutual repulsion, because that's sort of got everything filled. The P's, the PX, PY, PZ is nice and stable there, but once you get to this stage here, you've got that one extra electron causing some friction there in the p orbitals. So go back and review that. That's done in a lot more detail in topic one. So here we go. I've, I've just put a written explanation in here um, and just pay attention to the keywords again. Um, the ionization increases because the nuclear charge increases. I don't like to stop there. If you're doing a test, just double your points probably, potential of getting it right and say, just say the positive protons are increasing, causing more attraction to the electrons. So basically, it's, it's a really short, concise, keyword rich answer that's just going to make sure you get the answer right. Ionization energy decreases down a group because electrons are further away from the nucleus. The exons in lower shells are blocking, causing electron shielding. Now, I'll just give a demonstration here of that. So, here what I've done is I've put silver are actually non magnetic, but they're actually representing positive uh, attraction. And you can see here the 
actual gold ones are actually magnets, uh, but you don't need to know that, but they represent electrons. And so the electrons that are closer to the center uh, are gonna have feel more effective nuclear charge. All right, the nuclear charge doesn't change, but because they're closer, it is greater. And as you get further away, because of the distance, you can see I've made a smaller one. I put a smaller bell bearing in there, and that's to demonstrate that the effective nuclear charge is weaker because it's further away. But you also have these electrons here repelling it, and that's what that's what electron shielding is. So I've made the first one sodium. So it's got one electron on the outside. It's quite happy to lose that to get a, a full shell. Uh, and I've made the other one chlorine. So obviously what happens when the two come together, chlorine has a much stronger electronegativity ability to pour an electron to itself, and so it naturally wins, and so that's represented by the equation there. So here we go to electron affinity, which is what we were talking about. The energy that's released when one mole of electrons is attached to one mole of neutral atoms, or, or molecules in the gaseous phase. And there we have the representation here. So we have one mole of electrons combining to one mole of atoms in the gaseous phase. And you can use your data booklet to look up these values so you can see that the greatest amount of electronegativity is around here. And I just want to jump to this here because it's a uh, visual makes it much easier to see so the higher it is the more electronegativity there is so here we have another picture electronegativity is the measure of, of an ability of an atom to attract bonded electron pairs to itself in a covalent bond now we may as well just jump a little bit to topic four if the difference between them is 1.8 uh, it will form an ionic bond if it's anywhere between uh, 0 0.4 and 1.8 it's polar covalent. So you can see from this table here, water, so if hydrogen 2.1 binds with oxygen, the difference uh, 3.5 minus 2.1 is going to give you 1.4. And so that's gonna be a polar covalent bond, but it's still gonna be covalent. So we know water, you might know, you should know by now, uh, water is a covalent polar molecule with a plus and, and minus sort of poles. If you obviously, if you get carbon and hydrogen, that's 2.5 and 2.1, the difference is only 1, 0 0.4, so that's a non-polar covalent bond. And this here is a summary of everything we talked about, so just go over that if you need to. Just to go over the reactions now, these guys all want to gain an electron. So what you've got is you've got, even though you've got more and more positivity, the biggest thing in all of these things is the distance and that goes with all the forces like gravity uh, so gravity is uh, some mass one times mass two over the radius squared I think times by some other thing but the, the difference is this is radius squared so the distance is has an exponential effect on the force now gravity magnetism electrostatic effect they're all the same, okay? So they're all forces that all, all behave in a similar way, and chemistry is just one of those forces, Coulomb's law, positive and negative. Uh, and so I'm just using gravity because the equation's fairly simple. So increasing the masses is not as significant. So increasing the protons, the positivity, and the negativity is not as significant as the distance. And so what you have here is you go down. The distance, because they're going to new principal energy levels, new shells, distance is much, much greater. And so the ability of the electron to be attracted to the positive, nucle the positive nucleus decreases because the distance is further and further away and because of electron shielding. So fluorine is most reactive and it will have the best ability to take an electron from somebody else and so react. Uh, and so there's a demonstration here that I'll just jump to. All right, the next one here is showing uh, chlorine, fluorine and bromine. Uh, and why there is a difference in electronegativity. Now I've put uh, different size ball bearings again to represent the fact, and I've also done them as different sizes. So the fluorine here has uh, a much greater effective charge because it has a lower shell and so it has a, a less distance to the, the electron and because the there is less electron shielding. So the fluorine's greater. So if you have chlorine here, uh, and fluorine comes along, it has a much better ability to attract an electron to itself. And you can see the magnets work just like an electrons would. And the fluorine can come in there and replace chlorine. Okay, so that's just a, a demo of what happens chemically. Now what these things do is they, as you go down the periodic table is they, f they form diatomic molecules, these halogens. And so what the only forces you're really gonna have are London dispersion forces, which is a momentarily 
uh, formed induced dipole and so these things are going to become uh, as you see red so is a liquid these things are going to have increased melting and boiling points as you go down and so this one's a solid at room temperature and this one's a gas and bromine and mercury are the only ones that are liquids in the entire periodic table so here is a picture showing the changes in colors as you go down and here are the displacement reactions that we talked about in the demonstration. So what you need to do is you need to look at which one's the most reactive. And if chlorine is more reactive than bromine, then it's going to do the reacting and, and form that, that ion. So there's going to be an exchange of electrons. And so let's have a look at the periodic table quickly. So chlorine's there and bromine's there. So the chlorine will be more reactive than bromine. So chlorine will be the one that will want to do the reaction and get that full shell. Uh, if it was the other way around, we write no reaction because it wouldn't work. So bro chlorine has the ability to steal that electron and then bromine ends up having to go back to the atomic state and this gets to the ionic state. Lastly, this is a little bit nasty. Um, as you go across the periodic table, they, the metal oxides become ba are basic and then the non-metal oxides are acidic and that's where you get these things forming your acid rain. And this is why group one and group two is alkali and alkaline earth metals. So the, the name kind of tells you what's going to happen. So that's how you're going to work it out. The other way you work it out is you, you can work these uh, formula out by looking at the charges. I've got videos on how to do that if you're not good at doing ionic formula. And so you just think, well, a base is OH. What's the most common sodium base I know? So sodium hydroxide was the most common magnesium base I know. So it's magnesium hydroxide. When you get to the non-metals, just think of the most obvious, um, the most commonly seen uh, acid that you have. So that's phosphoric acid and sulfuric acid. I've written this in red because logic will pretty much get you all of these equations so far, except for these things. Sulfur trioxide is a liquid and the two gets you sulfur sulfurous acid and the three gets you sulfuric acid. So I would make a piece of paper uh, and it is only one piece of paper for all of IB that I think there are memorization things going on. You can't logically work your way through these things uh, and that's one I'd put on there for the memorization.